Mr. Shatner, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call station for a voice check. I'm, uh, I'm calling. This is Shatner. Do you hear me? Mr. Shatner, this is uh, the space research vessel, ISS, in Earth orbit. And yes, I hear you loud and clear. How do you hear me? This is Chris Hadfield. Chris, I hear you loud and clear. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. I, I'm so moved to uh, be able to speak to you for. I'm so moved to be able to speak to you for for this brief moment. So I want to I want to ask you some questions that uh, uh, have deep uh, have some deep meaning to me. So let me start off right away. Um, you, you, you're in the International Space Station, but you had to get there in a Russian vehicle. Are we, as America, uh, fallen behind, or is this just a pause on our space program? The uh, space business is an extremely difficult one, and if I think the best way to answer that question is to look at history. You know, we've never had regular access to space. We've had a, a space flight and then a landing and then we review everything and make sure it's safe and then we launch another one. And the shuttle was tremendously vehicle, a successful vehicle flying at 135 times. But it's not like in between flights we could just count on the next one. Every one was really much the, the, the max level of effort that we could do. And so it went from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo to shuttle with many, many lulls in between. And the time it takes to build a new vehicle is quite long. So uh, it, you could say we, we kind of lost our way in between every single launch. But in truth, that, that's not how it works. What it takes is an enormous effort of will and technical know-how to build a spaceship and then to be brave enough to launch one because you risk lives every time you do. And we're just right now in between vehicles, much as we were after Mercury, after Gemini, after Apollo. We're just in the after shuttle era right now. But fortunately, because of international cooperation, we're not grounded. And this place is uh, built by the world and very much put together with the United States as the, uh, as the foreman. And, uh, and fortunately, we didn't have to abandon it as we did Skylab because we didn't have a vehicle or cooperation. Because of cooperation with other countries, people are here living and working. And the United States will build another vehicle, and that will come up here also. Uh, so uh, it's by no means a lost way. Well, it's just I, a natural path. I read that you have already volunteered to go on a Mars mission. Uh, is the, is that have any reality to it? And... And, and because of the, uh, uh, the nature of this brief time, let me add to that question. Uh, you volunteered to go, but isn't that a fearful uh, uh, operation? Isn't that fraught with such uh, make, enormous difficulty uh, and danger? Uh, you've taken a lot of risks in your, in your life as well. Um, and... It was a risk that, that I decided to take many, many years ago. Really to accomplish anything worthwhile in life is going to take risk. Um, and even if you decide to stay at home and, and sit at your kitchen table, eventually uh, the ceiling will fall or there'll be a hurricane or a tornado. You can't live a worthwhile life without taking risks. And some th Let me just say, uh, between the, the real life exploits of the first astronauts and the, the visually fantasized and, and enlivened ones like you portrayed on Star Trek and so many other people have in, in, in literature, um, they inspire people like me to do things like this. And, and without that inspiration, um, and then without the technological capability that comes along with it, none of it would be possible. And I, I'm in a position to say that uh, the risks are infinitely worthwhile when you look at the, the view that's just out these windows behind me and the things that lie just beyond. And yes, going to Mars is inevitable, uh, just as sailing across the Atlantic or flying across the Atlantic or orbiting around the world or going to the moon. It's just a matter of when we figure out how. We put ourselves together enough. We take those, those visualized dreams and fantasies and turn them into reality, which is what we're doing here, right now. You are, uh, you have many degrees in mechanical engineering, and you must see the universe 
in terms of uh, how extraordinary a mechanical uh, engineering feat th- that uh, is and how mystifying it is because we know nothing. Uh, do you find yourself uh, in the space station observing as a scientist a part of it, uh, a, 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 a removed from it, or are you able to be to see the unifying parts of it so that you become at one with the universe? Uh, luckily, I think, Bill, the answer is both. Um, mo- most people, the highest they ever get is maybe to climb a tall hill or climb a mountain and look around, or even get in an airplane and, and start to see what lies beyond the, the normal two dimensions, the, the surface of the world of normal life. Um, to have the opportunity to get as far away as we are here, and not only that, but to go around the world every 90 minutes. and. You never saw it on, on stage while you were filming, um, but the view that they used to put in for us watching Star Trek of how the world looks out of uh, Sulu and Chekhov's windows there, that's how the world looks. It's an enormous, wonderful, rolling earth below us. But all you have to do is flip yourself upside down and suddenly the rest of the universe is right there um, at your feet below you and that's where the the engineer in me of course is, is very much thinking about the ship and and how we got here and the, and the problems and the difficulties but the human within me recognizes what we are in between we've gone from climbing a hill getting in an airplane to now actually being right on the cusp of permanently leaving our planet to everything else that exists and and I feel uh, hugely connected to that. It, it's what it was inspired in me as a kid, and I've kind of directed my whole life. I became an engineer and a fighter pilot and a test pilot to try and gain the skills to maybe someday do this. And now I'm, I'm doing my absolute best to help people see that, to help us understand where we are uh, kind of philosophically and historically in our increased human understanding of where we do lie in the universe. Right. Those are great big words for, for a, you know, a, a lab technician on a space station. Uh, but, I know. But I, but I definitely get a sense of that all the time. Uh, I, I, it's inspiring to hear. Let me go back to a moment. Uh, you've tested many airplanes. You've, you've uh, been a test pilot, which is like the utmost of uh, 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 example of courage in that you're flying something uh, unknown and you don't know what characteristics is going to have. How do you deal with the fear, at, which is also applicable to going up into space and, and returning, which is perhaps even more fearful? Um, I, I read somewhere that uh, you always knew your lines whenever you had a job in the acting profession. I have tried to always know my lines, whether it was as, as a fighter pilot or, or as an astronaut or as a test pilot. And, and the, way I, the way I deal with fear is I try to define what it is that's scaring me. And what I'm scared most of is not knowing what to do next. You know, to be uh, struck dumb on stage or to, to be uh, responsible for a vehicle and not know the right actions to take with my hands or with the spaceship. And so I spent almost my entire adult life making sure that, that I knew my lines, that, that when the Soyuz spaceship, which I helped fly up here, that if, I, I spent years, of course, learning to speak Russian and then learning to fly that spaceship. And even though it flew itself basically flawlessly up here, no matter what happened, uh, Roman Romanenko and I were ready to jump in and fly it and take over and do it all manually mm-hmm. and fly it home. Mm-hmm. And that, it, that's a terrifying thing initially, but after years of training where you, you practice everything right down to the nth detail so you know you have the confidence that comes with that, then the fear diminishes. It feels um, like you're on the crest of a wave of ability, and that really diminishes fear. You've poised that perfectly as a, an actor uh, who is fearful of the audience, but as long as you practice enough, you, you learn what to expect. The fear comes from uh, something unexpected happening, like forgetting your words or an audience reaction uh, that's unexpected. Uh, in my case, uh, your, your face flushes and you get a sheen of uh, flop sweat. In your case, you burn up. It's a little different. 
Yeah, well, in, in both cases, you go down in flames. <laughs> but one's figurative and, and one is not. Um, <laughs> but I, I, my wife, my wife, uh, Bill, my wife is actually, when people ask her if she's scared of what I do for a living, um, as you say, prior to this, I was, I was a, a test pilot. That was a much more risky profession. I basically lost one good friend a year for the whole time that I was a professional uh, high-performance pilot. And um, so, y yes, this this job has has risk and a level that is fairly high, but uh, there are lots of professions on earth that have a lot of risk. The people, firemen and soldiers and, and some of the professions on earth, and I respect them all for them understanding their job, really applying themselves and professionally getting their particular uh, piece of work done in the world. But there's another risk involved here as well. You're up there for six months. That's a long time to be away, isn't that? Uh, it is. Um, we have pretty good communications. That think of what you and I are doing right now. You know, you think about about uh, the stuff that was portrayed on, on television 40 years ago, of uh, people with a small handheld device standing on the surface of a planet, talking to someone effortlessly who is orbiting that planet. That's what you and I are doing right now. And so I can do the same with my friends and family. I can talk to them pretty much every day, and. So it's not that much different than just being on a long business trip. And, and training as an international space station astronaut takes you all around the world for years. So in truth, it's, it's a four or five year period of which five or six months you're, you're in orbit. But uh, with the level of technology we have right now, it removes a lot of the, of the sense of remoteness to it. So, it, so it's, uh, we're busy, happy, hardworking, and we still That's have wonderful to communication hear. with the world. That's wonderful to hear, Chris. I'm getting a little nudging uh, that we're running over time. So many questions about the future of space and, and, and the Mars mission and all. I would look forward to another time to speak to you in, uh, in great depth and find out uh, the, the larger implications of the questions uh, that I was uh, I've so briefly been able to ask you. You know, th those scenes when you were in Boston Legal were at the end of the show and you sit out sort of on the veranda or the balcony <laughs> and maybe over a, a, a cigar and a whiskey and talk of life. Uh, I, I, you ought to come to my cottage and sit on a porch. I would love the chance to talk uh, with you uh, about uh, this and, and compare notes. It, Northern this Ontario. is a fabulous experience. Northern Ontario is one of my favorite places. I'll bet you have a cottage up there. Yeah, we have an Ontario cottage, and yeah, you ought to come visit. It's a great place to think about the world and, and watch satellites go over and uh, and really reflect on where I know, we are. Man. I, know the, I know you were short on time. I know the area. It's a pleasure, Chris. I look forward to meeting you in person and uh, sitting down with a whiskey and a cigar. All right, very nice talking with you. Thanks very much, and uh, all the best. Thank you. Same to you. Bye-bye. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes your conversation with Mr. Shatner. Please stand by for a voice check from CSA headquarters. Hello. Greetings, Chris. It's Jeremy here with you at, the, at our home, the Canadian Space Agency. How do you hear me? I'll take that as a yes. Jeremy, I have you loud and clear. Great to hear your voice, and hello to everybody in, hello to everybody in St. Hubert. Can you hear me okay? We've got you loud and clear too, Chris. 